Growing up in a country like Malaysia, it's almost impossible not to encounter a new language every now and then. To me personally, I prefer to speak English as my daily mode of communication, but it's different in Malaysia. In primary school, I'd hear Bahasa Malaysia more than any other language. In high school, I'd hear Mandarin phrases being thrown into sentences every now and then. And even in university, I'd hear my friends speak Tamil all the time. So this mixture of languages isn't something that's really new to me. That's what I thought until I started work in 2019. My colleagues would constantly speak in Mandarin, even in the meetings I was in. And to be fair, I'm completely fine with people speaking in their preferred language for as long as everyone in that conversation understands what's going on. But this wasn't the case. During the first meeting itself, I said, guys, could you please speak in English? And they were like, oh yeah, sure, sorry, sorry. They apologized and then they started speaking in English. And that was great. But then three minutes later, they started speaking in English and incorporating Mandarin words into it. But at that point, it was still fine because I could understand what they were saying. But then 10 minutes later, we're back to square one where they keep speaking Mandarin all over again. So I realized this process just kept going on and on and on and it was repetitive. Realizing that this was going nowhere, I said to myself, it's time for me to approach this in a different way. All this while, I've been trying to get the environment to adapt to me. But this time, I'm going to change and try to adapt into the environment instead. So the night I got home, I listed out possible ways for me to curb this issue. So of course, one of the most obvious solutions was for me to learn Mandarin. But to be fair, it's almost impossible. It's a no-go option considering that Mandarin takes extremely long to learn and I'm only going to be with this company for about a year or so until the project ends. So that was out of the window. The second option was for me to record the entire meeting and then have a friend, friend later come and translate and explain the entire meeting to me. But this would also be extremely unfair to my friend. It would be extremely time consuming and I would only know what was going on in the meeting after the meeting was over. So that was also out of the window. I was running out of options. And I just kept remembering and telling myself how cool would it be if I had superpowers that would enable me to learn and understand almost any language. And then it hit me. I remembered watching the Google I.O. Summit and how they introduced the Google Pixel earbuds. For those who don't know what the Google Pixel earbuds are, they are a pair of earphones that enables you to translate any language in real time to your preferred language. And I told myself, this is it. This is the solution to one of my problems. But of course, I spoke too soon. Because at that point of time, the Pixel Buds were retaining for 700 ring ringgit. And I didn't have that much money to throw around. So even if I did, I probably wouldn't have bought it because it's too expensive. So I told myself, there's only two options from here. It's either number one, I fork out all my money and spend it on the Google Pixel earbuds and be broke for the rest of the month, or I build it myself. See, here's the thing. Ever since I was young, I've always been fascinated with technology. But unfortunately, technology comes with a very, very hefty price. A price I couldn't afford back then. When people were carrying PSPs as their game consoles, I was only carrying those 8-bit games. When people had phones that could support WhatsApp, I still carried a phone that could only support SMS. But it's this exact same mentality that I was raised in, built a mindset in me that said, if I can't buy it, then it's okay, I'm gonna build it myself. So then I got home and I started my work. I drew an architecture diagram of how I'd make that entire system work and I researched the Google API key. So once I was done with that, I researched the FCC website to get what data and what details of the hardware and components I'm gonna be using. Once I got that sorted out, I got a Google API key and I searched more in details about how the code and how the code base underlying it works. Once that two were done, I searched for a voice synthesis API. And since my system was web-based, I had to get one that was web-based as well. So I settled for responsivevoice.js, which is a JavaScript API. Once everything worked, I worked on the UI, I made a web interface, and I made it look nice. And then once I was done and it was perfected craftily into my own tailored uh, method, I told myself, why stop here? Why do the same thing that the company is already doing? So I took it a step further. I added my own features. I added a real-time transcript writer that could write every single thing that was said in the conversation, regardless of how many people were in that conversation. 
Aside from that, I also added a keyword identifier so that I could tell what the topic was about in that conversation and learn more about that topic. So after I was done building this entire thing, I decided to post it on Twitter as a thread because it's what I normally do with all the rest of my inventions and I thought it was going to be extremely normal. But I was wrong. This time it was extremely different. It got over 10,000 retweets and news outlets and media companies came to cover it. And it was extremely unbelievable and unexpected. But I realized throughout this whole thing, one common thing was people asked me, wow, how did you get such great problem solving skills? Or wow, I wish I had such great problem solving skills as well. But here's the thing, problem solving skills are not something you have to be born with. It's a mindset and a mentality. You don't have to be a genius to be a great problem solver. Essentially, there are only five steps to problem solving. Number one, knowing what the problem actually is. Number two, determining the limitations and the boundaries. Number three, determining what the actual goal is. Number four, listing out all possible ways to attain the goals. And number five, executing it. And I think the best way to walk you through this is to tell you the, st the time of how I won an engineering competition despite having any background in engineering. So if you're an engineering student, you're most probably familiar with the concept of robot cars. I think if I'm not mistaken, it's used as an introduction or an assignment to engineering. So one of my friends had the same BattleBot robot car concept where the cars will have to race in a lane of four against each other. And the best part is there are no rules, meaning the car can toss your car up in the air. It can burn your car to fumes. It can beat the life out of your car with a hammer and there's not a single thing you can do about it. So it was about a week more till the competition began and my friend had some issue with his coding, so he called me. So I went and helped him and when I went to the engineering lab, I saw a ton of other robots. And at that very moment, I knew my friend's 30 by 30 CM robot stood no chance against everyone else's two foot robot. So I decided to help him. Let's analyze this scenario really quickly. Let's determine what the problem actually is. So we have two problems here. Number one, our robot is incapable of fighting. It is practically useless. It can run to the finish line, but it can't defend itself, itself if any attack comes towards its way. So that's out of the question. The second problem is that everyone else had a better robot than us. So from here, we know there's two solutions. Number one, we either build a better robot and bring it up to everyone's level, or number two, we bring everyone's robots down to our level. Step two, know what the limitations and boundaries are. So I asked my friend, are you sure there are no rules? And he said, yes. His lecturer said the robots can be as brutal as they want for as long as they don't hurt any human. Of course, there were requirements as well, such as the robots had to have a minimum of four wheels or more, the robots had to be controlled by a Wi-Fi chip. But that aside, now that we know what our limitations and boundaries are, we can start formulating solutions and making sure that it doesn't exceed the scope of what we're allowed to do. Step three, make sure you know what the actual goal is. So if it isn't obvious, the goal here is to win. That's true, but there's many ways you can see it. So always try to look at it from all angles. In this case, I would suggest we always break the goal down to its core. Before you ask yourself, how do I win? Ask yourself, what constitutes a win? For instance, when I asked my friends, what is the goal? They said it's to build the toughest, most strongest robot. And to be fair, that's a fair goal to make. But that's not the answer I'm looking for, because here's why. Even if you had the toughest, most strongest robot, you're not necessarily going to secure a win. What if midway through the race, your robot's motor fails? Or what if another team's strategy is to emphasize more on speed rather than strength? Then in both scenarios, you would have already lost. Which is why I said, break the goal down to its core. So when I asked myself what the goal was, it is so simple. It's to make sure that my robot was the first to cross the finish line. Whether or not it gets beaten or torn apart along the way, it doesn't matter. Because for as long as my robot is the first to cross the finish line, then it has already secured a win. Step four, list all possible ways to attain this goal. I think a great way to do this is to get every component and aspect involved in this scenario and see what roles they play in each of the situation. 
So for this instance, we have the racetrack, we have the race car, we have the remote controllers that are controlling the race cars, and we have the people that are controlling the remotes. So let's look at each aspect. What if we wanted to manipulate the racetrack, for instance? We could have our robot pour oil all over the racetrack, but that would only be successful under the assumption that our robot doesn't get affected by it as well. So that's a risk we have to take. Let's put that aside. Second, what if we focused on the robot car itself? Well, that's what everyone is already focusing on. And with the weeks left, there's nothing much we can actually do. So let's put that aside. What if we focus on the people controlling the controllers? Well, unless I'm Professor X and I have the ability to manipulate people's minds into doing what I want to do, then of course we'd win. But the chances of that happening is zero. So then the perfect solution hit me. Why try so hard like every other team in attempting to kill each other's robots when I could just kill all the remotes instead? Because the concept is simple. No robot would be able to function without its remote. So, I got to work. In the next three days, I added an IoT chip onto the board of the car and the robot car, and then I wrote a script. I wrote a de-authentication script that would cut all Wi-Fi networks that are connected to each other from what I select. So the script will only execute when I ask it to execute. Step five, execution. I remember on the day of the competition itself, when we walked in, everyone was laughing at our robot, and I don't blame them. It came with zero attack or defense mechanism. So they were laughing, and a lot of people said they wanted to go against our robot first, because that would secure them a way, way easy win. And I agree with that. But I can still remember the moment the bell rang indicating the start of the race. With four lanes, three lanes were swerving, and people were fighting each other, and then there was our robot, that was super small, moving like a snail. And while everyone was hitting each other and fighting each other, we were just moving along the straight line path. And when one of the teams were halfway towards the finish line, I executed a script, I picked out the three, teams, uh, the three other teams that I wanted to de-authenticate, and in less than seconds, the only robot moving in that lane was mine. So in that very moment, everyone was hitting their tablets, people were moving their remotes, they're asking why is it not working. So, if you're wondering how it works, it's very simple. What I did was I exploited a flaw in the 802.11 protocol. This allows me to send frames of data to an, uh, from an unauthorized device like mine. And the best part about this is that regardless of how many people and how many times you try to connect back to that <coughs> Wi-Fi, you won't be able to. So, everyone just stood there watching their robot helplessly stay in their lanes while I was, I was, was moving forward. So of course, at the end of the day, we won the race. People were extremely upset. They said that it was unfair, but to be fair, it's a competition. And just like every other attack from every other robot, our attacks came from our robot as well. Not a single rule was violated. So there you have it. Many people ask, how do you get such good problem-solving skills? And to be honest, a lot of people think problem-solving is more of a theoretical approach. But that's actually wrong. It's way, way far from that. Problem solving, as I said, is a mindset. And it's easier said than done, but there are many ways for you to train your problem solving skills. You could do puzzles like Rubik's Cubes, or you could do competitive programming. And if you want to be better at strategy and execution, I would suggest you play chess. Essentially, I do my best to make sure I'm updated with today's <coughs> industry of technology. I challenge myself every now and then to build something new. For instance, I build an augmented reality workspace that functions just from my phone and a card. I build my own version of Google Home that controls and automates my entire house. I even hacked the components in a MyV and turned it into somewhat of a Tesla. So all these kind of projects, while they are a great way for me to spend my time and to sharpen my software and hardware skills, there's also a message I've been trying to send out to the younger generation of Malaysians. And it's a very simple message. You can be a billion dollar tech company. You can have a ton of resources, an abundance of employees working for you, hectares of office space. But even then, a boy in a room could still build what you are capable of building with less than a quarter of the resources that you have. And it's a very, very simple message I hope people take into account. I realized a lot of people within my age, 
the reason they don't start something is because they don't know where to start. But thanks to the internet, that's no longer a problem. You can learn almost anything. You have an issue in your code, search it up on Stack Overflow. You don't know how something works, search it up on Google. You've got websites like Skillshare, Codecademy, Tutorials Point, all of which are free and can help you learn almost any skill you want. So it's no longer an excuse because learning is not an overnight process. It's a recursive process of trial and error. So yeah, I hope to see more students build technologies which are in par or not better than all these tech giants. So now let's just take a very, very small step back and wonder from the very beginning, what if I had spent that 700 ringgit on those earphones? That's it. That would be the end of the story, the end of my bank account, the start of my life in leaving the streets because my mother would have slapped me for spending 700 on earphones. But no, instead, I decided to build it myself. I spent way less money and every single thing built was tailored and customized to myself. And that's the best part about it. That's the best part about inventing things in general. You spend way less, you learn way more, and every single thing you build is tailored to you. And one of the biggest perks is that even if it breaks, and even if one of your inventions shatters, it doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about warranties, because now you can just build a better one for yourself all over again. My name is Roshan Makhan, and I'll end my speech here. Thank you.